So what are some key things that you look for to potentially identify, you know, those unknown names, which have those tremendous characteristics that could, you know, do six times, eight times, as you mentioned. You know, Bill O'Neill created this template based on history of great leading stocks. And it's, it's quite simple. Pre-tax, after-tax, ROE, sales growth, earnings growth, earnings estimates, earnings surprise. The leader is going to have almost all those. Now, Eric Kroll did a study and he proved that something like a very high number, 20 or 30% of stocks have no earnings that lead. But the real security institutions like earnings, okay? You know, listen, in a bear market, no earnings growth stocks get obliterated. They just, they, they, there's no value. It's hard to value them. But the true liquidity driven leaders are going to have all those metrics. They're less risky. They're all stocks are very risky. But when you have earnings and all those beautiful metrics, those stocks tend to trend better, are more durable, less volatile, because you have the big players, the monster institutions. You know, quick quiz, two companies, both growing at 30% a year, one trades $8 million worth of daily dollar volume and one trades a billion. Which one's going to have a higher PE? Billion dollar. Correct. Because Fidelity can't buy, you know, an $8 million daily average daily dollar volume. So the PE on the billion dollar stock is going to be 60 and the PE on the 8 million daily dollar volume stock is going to be like you know, 12, because no one can buy it. I can't even buy it. I mean, when you look at the liquidity in the market and the number of names out there that are truly liquid, where I can go buy 10, $20 million worth, it's about 200 stocks. That's it. So you're screening for those variables. And like the beauty, we were talking offline before this about Kathy Wood and how she's the poster child for the big, big rally. And like I rambled off, like there was a Lane Garzarelli and Ryan Jacobs and Don Wallenchuk and Robert Prechter. These were your gurus of every cycle going back to the 80s when I started. They were all pretty brilliant people, but focused on a specific niche. And when that area came into favor, they were rock stars, not because they were rock stars, because the market treated that sector perfectly. And when that rolls over, it goes dormant for 10, 20 years. But can slim is predicated on the new, like Bill says, what the golden list is the new high list. So it's always gonna keep you in tune and you throw in fundamental analysis with all those metrics and then trend following. So, you know, the, your leader is not gonna have RS of 12 and be below the 50, the 200, it's just not. Um, so you, we need to get those MAs in a, in a bullish alignment with the indexes. And your new leader is going to be a basketball that's just going to spring up because it's been held underwater for nine mm -hmm. months. Um, and also, I've really been fortunate with some IPOs that came public at the end of bears. When you can get an institution to pony up at the end or in the middle of a bear, it's going to be just like pristine, pristine. It's going to have everything. So just, we haven't seen many. There's been a couple of really small deals, but nothing that I've seen yet, but we'll probably see some of that. I don't Perfect. know. New high list, buddy. Yep. Make it simple. And for in terms of the new high list, are you referring to all-time highs or just 52-week highs? Um, I'd love to hear that distinction. 52-week new highs. And I'm, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. A lot of things I say, I then refine and twist them a little bit. In a bear market like this, the damage is so enormous. I'm looking for great action, maybe 20, 30% off the highs. Mm -hmm. But look at like, when you look at LI, um, the auto EV manufacturer in China, it's at all time new highs. It's it's right there. So that has a very unique signature telling you that it's it's rare merchandise. OK, I mean, it, it just it. Why would you buy anything that has massive overhead when a, a stock in the same group is within two percent of the all time high? It just it doesn't make any sense. You're fooling around with the second best player. And I did a study and I proved that the difference between the number one stock in a group and number two is 50%. If the leader goes up 300, 
the number two stock goes up 150. Right. So I want that. Now, the problem is this. If you miss the leader, now you're aware of the sector mm -hmm. and the number two stock's going to set up and you're going to go for it because number one's extended. And I, you know, I am, I, I, I do have a stock right now that is like number two because exactly that situation exactly happened. But I'll, you know, I think if Bill was here, he'd say, you're going to have to find a way in, whether you're going to take the added risk and you're going to load up at a two weeks tight or a pullback to the 50. You just, when you identify the monster, you know, Bill always had him. I would talk to him and invariably he would be in the very best two or three names of the whole market. Well, nobody gets all those names at the perfect place. They, you know, they sneak up on you, you miss them. I mean, even Bill missed them. No question about it, but he ended up working his way in. Mm -hmm. But it, when you miss the first true bear market cup and handle and it takes off, that's your ultimate lowest risk point. Every secondary, secondary buy points are higher risk. They're much better for ads than start a whole new position. And uh, coming back to, you know, separating that distinction between the leader and, you know, the silver medal in the group. Um, I love to hear you talk about the distinction and how you determine what is the leader and, and what, are, what are overall groups that are leading as well. I think that'd be, that'd be awesome. <clears throat> I mean, you know, Bill would say it's the stock you're up the most on. It's the stock that has the 99 RS, the 2.0 up to down volume. It, it, they stand out like sore thumbs. It's not hard to find them. It's hard to commit to them because they're going to be extended. It's hard to be patient. You know, most people will find it and they'll be like, oh, it's a lock. It's going to go up 200% and they'll buy it extended. And they're going to get whipped out in 20 minutes or worse. They won't cut their loss, which is the biggest rookie mistake of all time. It's not hard to find them. Any jackass can screen. It's how do you handle what you find? Um, yeah, it's going to be sticking straight up in the air. It's going to look just like LI. It's going to look just like that. Um, it, 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 I'm trying to answer your question with a, a, an answer of a little um, cavalier, but it's obvious which ones they are. It's where's the best lowest risk entry point and not getting FOMO and just saying, oh, it's so strong. It's a 99 RS. It's a lock. It's going to pull back at that point. But like LI, it's theoretically flagging here. It's yep. not unthinkable that, you know, and so how often do you see a legit high tight flag? Once a year, um, they're super duper rare, but there's a, I don't know if I answered that exactly the way you wanted. No, I think that makes sense. Um, and I wanna ask you, cause I think this is really important because you mentioned, you know, getting shaken out here. So once you've determined, you know, a potential monster stock what can you do to make sure you manage it correctly? Because I think that's something that takes a little bit of time and experience to deal with and probably getting shaken out of, of a few times uh, before you really understand what you've got to do. So how do you manage a monster stock? Well, most people aren't running a fund and I'm trying to put fairly big, I, my, even though my fund is super small, it's a couple hundred, it doesn't matter. I'm taking positions that are so big. They're as big as most, head, most big mutual funds. And so I'll buy it and it'll pull back a little bit and I'll get whipped out of a little bit, like, you know, down 3%, I'll trim it out and it'll come back up again and I'll buy more. And I, I'm building this position until the market, the pressure comes off and, the, and it can just take off. And you, the simple answer, I could have answered this one sentence, you gotta work around your position. Mm -hmm.